Well, today is the Sunday of the year where we celebrate the baptism of the Lord. And it's always important to me to move the font and to move the font to a central place in the church. Because even though it's a piece of furniture that usually, and for sometimes for years, just sits out of view or sits in view, but we don't pay attention to it, it's only fair that on this Sunday that we pay attention to it. Even though there will be no baptism, unless there's somebody here that would like to be baptized that I don't know about, happy to do it. But today, again, is the baptism of the Lord Sunday. It follows Epiphany Sunday. And it's the time where we pause to not only focus on the centrality of the font within the architecture and the sacred space of a church, but also the practice, the sacrament, the identity. What does it mean to be baptized? And so this Sunday, we'll focus on that using Matthew's story of the baptism of Jesus and some other secondary sources that will help us think about what does it really mean to be baptized? What does it really mean to bring forth our children, our infants, our young members of the family, or as an adult? What does it mean to come forward to the font? I probably mentioned before, an acquaintance of mine years and years ago, Bill Wiley Kellerman, uh, used to be part of the Sojourners community and wrote for them, and he once said, uh, you know, when he and his late wife were thinking about baptizing their children, that it was a real challenging situation. It was frightening to them to think about what they were committing their children to. Frightening, and not in the sense that they were afraid, but that the risk involved when you read those vows that we take on behalf of our children or we take ourselves, they're very powerful. They're not just light, words that we say and recite, as we often do. There are promises that we make to stand in the face of evil, to resist oppression in all its forms. And they were really concerned about that. Having committed their lives to the struggle for social justice, they knew what it was like to resist evil, to be in jail, and so on. And so let's focus on not only the vows this morning, but what does it mean for us the baptized community, to live our life in community and in the world. Welcome to worship.
Thank you, Hannah and Sabindi. I wanted you just to pause for a second because I was really moved. I was impressed by what you were doing. I think it was Sabindi was sharing with you the light because yours went out, right? Yeah, sometimes it's really hard to bring the light into the world. And I want to just say, what are we grabbing at? I want to say thank you for the good work you're doing, Sabindi and Hannah, and others that are bringing the light into the world. And I want to thank you for giving us, again, an example of how we as Christians are called to share the light, just like you two did in the aisle. One light went out, Sabindi gave you new light. That's what we do. Thanks. You can go now, Sabindi. Good morning. Uh, would you uh, rise if it's comfortable for you um, to join in the call to worship? <clears throat> Open your hearts to the will of God. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. <clears throat> The Lord speaks with glory and majesty. Listen for God's message for us today. The voice of the Lord is strong, echoing throughout the May the Lord bless us with strength. Come, O God, and guide your people. Glory to the Lord. May the Lord bless us with Our first hymn is Fairest Lord Jesus, number 189 in the hymnal. of redemption, calm our fears, and fill us with your spirit. You call us by name, proclaiming we are yours, and you are our God. Send your Holy Spirit 
into this congregation and strengthen us for service in your name. Amen. Please be seated. I'm going to call the children up to join me here at the font. Right here, we're going to start. We're not going to sit down uh, this morning. And uh, I need a little help from um, MJ. Miss MJ, could you please go to the little kitchenette and bring some water? Water. How are we doing this morning? It's great to see everyone. I said the word font. Does anybody know what the font is? No? What kind of font are we talking about? Good question. Font and font, right? You're getting close. This is the font right here. No, this whole wooden structure and bowl within a bowl all together is the font. It's called a baptismal font. Now you're going to ask me, what's baptism, right? I know what baptism is. You do? Tell me. I know what badminton is. Badminton is not baptism. Have you ever seen a baptism? Yeah. Do you remember a baptism? Yeah, no. Hannah. I know I've seen it. You saw your cousin get baptized. And there may have been, there should have been a font there, right? And it should have been a minister or a priest, a uh, pastor placing water on the head of the child. Or in some traditions, the person actually goes into a pool that is below the floor right there. We don't have one but they're completely emerged. Thank you so much. So a font is not a font without water, right? It's a structure, we could still call it a font, but you need to add water. Does anybody wanna add the water? Someone has to be, Hannah, would you do it because you're, all right, now you can put your hands in it. Let's put our hands in it, let's feel the water. Ooh, Ooh. you can't get your hand up here, come on. Get your, can you get your, do you want to put your hand in? No? Oh, you feel it? Yeah, I feel it. What's it feel like? Water. Water? Water. Yeah. Put our hands in it, it might overflow. Might overflow, okay. All right, let's take our hands out. Now your hands are all wet. Ugh. I wanted you to feel, you want your hands to dry off? Did you get to try, Emmy? Could you feel, you can't reach. You want to put your hand in the water? Yeah, yeah. I just want you to feel the water. It doesn't mean anything special today. It's not a baptism. I just want you to understand that water and this bowl and this structure go together to make the baptismal font. This morning we're gonna talk about Jesus. He was baptized, but the font was not this type of thing. It was a river and John the Baptist did it. So you're asking me, I can think, a lot of questions that you probably have in your head, and you're probably saying, well, why do we do this? Why do we have baptism? Does anybody have an idea? Why do we have baptism? So, I'm sorry, Hannah? <coughs> to show our belief in God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also is a way. Who doesn't? Oh, I'm not sure about that, but it might be true. I don't know. We... Okay, we'll talk about that later. It is true. Okay. Well, anyways, we're still talking about baptism right now. And what we're doing is learning about how we're connected. I had you all put your hands in here to feel the water. It's the water and God's love that connects us. And so here we are, standing by the font, remembering that even though we have different names, have different families, a lot of differences, we come together as one as we share in the water. And I can see that many of you like to play in the water. So remember, the water is not only what we drink and gives strength to plants and animals in us, it is a symbol of God's love as well. So would you pray with me? You can keep your hands in the water if you want, or you can just bow your head here. Dear God, we thank you for the gift of baptism and the beautiful children that are here with us to learn about baptism. We thank you for connecting us all in this wonderful story. We thank you for the power and strength of baptism and what it will train and enable us to do as your baptismal community. 
Bless these children as they grow into this community. And may they come forward as those who are eager to enter the river and to bring others to that good news. Amen. Thanks for coming up. One last chance. Oh, don't do that. Okay. We'll see you later. You're welcome. I don't think I want to touch that with wet hands. <laughs> there. Thank you. Yes. Usually the children help with the Lord's Prayer, but we had a different arrangement, so I'm going to invite you to join me this morning in praying the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Let us pray together. Loving God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> the scripture for today is found in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw God's spirit descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from the heavens said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. God is still speaking. Please stand if you're comfortable doing so as we sing our next hymn, which is found on the screen, as well as in the hard, excuse me, the soft covered hymn of the faith we sing, I was born there to hear your morning cry.
can welcome to worship this morning. Uh, welcome to those that are worshiping online, on Zoom or YouTube. Welcome to those who have come, uh, maybe for the first time, to visit, to be in worship, to be present to God and to one another. Let us pray. God of the River Jordan, Lord of John the Baptist, Heavenly One, creator of all things good, we come to you on this holy day to dedicate ourselves and to turn ourselves towards you as we center on the great gift that you have shared with us through Christ Jesus. The wonderful gift and sacrament of baptism that makes us who we are and invites us into the life of discipleship and to live into a community that is unique, unique in its behaviors, unique, O oh Lord, because your spirit has been poured out upon us to shape us, to give us a new heart, to challenge us, to live into the world as living signs of your beloved one, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, if you'll remember any name from my time here with you, you'll remember Walter Brueggemann because I always go back to Walter Brueggemann. One of those great theologians and biblical scholars that has obviously made a mark on my life and my ministry. Years ago, I read an article that he wrote in a, for a journal that is no longer in existence. The title of the article was Together in Spirit Beyond Seductive Quarrels. And in this particular article, Professor Brueggemann spends a lot of time talking about the alternative way of life of a Christian and how our alternative way of life is really our way of living out God's alternative life message, the gospel. Dr. Brueggemann talks about the evangel, the news that is shared with the world, the message that Christians bring forth, a message which is not only a life message, but is a message that helps us identify before others who we are. And what Dr. Brueggemann says, which I always find helpful in thinking about my baptismal identity and yours too, is that what he calls a baptismal identity is an identity that makes us, one, odd, two, free, and three, able. So those who are part of the baptismal community, those who long to be part of the baptismal community, would be known as those who are odd and free and able. Think about that. How odd are we? How free are we? And how able are we to bring forth God's message in the world, which is the charge of the baptismal community, as well as those vows that I referred to earlier, which is the message of resistance and opposition to that which separates God from God's people in the world. The injustice, the evil, the prejudices, the oppression. Carrie Blakinger, in her book titled Corrections in Ink, Dan's read that, it's a wonderful autobiography story of her life. She writes and is so honest and so forthright in unfolding her young adult life before the reader. She tells the story of how she grew up as a professional ice skater, figure skater. She was on the track for becoming an Olympian, very close. She was a couple's pair of beautiful skaters that would take the ice and always had a captive audience. She was growing up very fast in this life, traveling around the country and 
again, internationally, as she was starting to shape her life. And she tells that story, but she also tells the story of how that life started to fade away, and she became a student, a college student. But in between the fading of the figure skater and becoming a student at Cornell University, she becomes addicted to a variety of behaviors, including substances. And she tells the story. She tells the story how she moves from professional skater to addict to convicted heroin dealer. All while happening in a very short period of time and happening while she's at one of the the country's most prominent universities, Cornell University. And she's so honest, as I said, she turns herself inside out to you, the reader, if you pick up the book, laying out her inner self, her inner self upon the dehumanizing landscape of prison, because that's where she ends up. Arrested, thrown into county jail for an extended period of time, and then sentenced. I want to share with you a reflection that she shares in her book, and I'm just going to give it a title taking from what she wrote. It's a reflection on living life as a number versus the free world. The words of Carrie Blankenship. Without shock, I had 16 months left. 16 months of counting down the days of living life as a number, at least to the people in charge. To everyone else, I had a jail name, one of personalized monikers we gave each other behind bars. There was a blue, a one-armed red, a Peter Pan, a few Chinas, several aces, a butter and a beans, and even a pork chop. There was a bad baby and at least two misunderstoods a couple of scrappies and a trouble. There was a Justin Bieber and a Tinkerbell. And then there was me, Harry Potter. In the free world, I don't think I really look like the wizarding wonder, but with my short hair, glasses, and no makeup or piercings in a collared prison uniform, the resemblance was unapparently, well, apparently uncanny. Starting in my first week upstate, Complete strangers would spot me on the walkway and shout, Oh my God, Harry Potter! Why is Harry Potter in prison? Anywhere else, I might have been offended. But behind bars, having a jail name felt like a confirmation of our humanity. A subversive demonstration that we could be something other than the numbers assigned to us by the state. These weren't names we'd ever use in the free world. And that kind of made sense. In prison, we were different people. Jail names. Jail names. Gary says, jail names felt like a confirmation of our humanity. We could be something other the numbers assigned to us by the state. In a real sense, Carrie's jail name made her in Brueggemann's words, odd, free, and able. John the Baptist, well, he was surely one who was odd, free, and able. The gospel lays out his odd wardrobe and his odd eating habits. You know that, the camel skin, the locust, the honey, Can't get much odder than that. But also speaks to his freedom. John the Baptist was free to convict religious leaders, to call them out, to call them into the wilderness, and to name them vipers. What are you, brood of vipers, doing out here? Who called you to repentance, says John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was not only odd, and free, he was able. John the Baptist was able to turn himself completely over to God. He wasn't out there in the wilderness for his own sake. He wasn't on retreat. He did retreat from the center of Jerusalem and went to the River Jordan for a purpose like all good prophets. What other 
purpose than to be closer to God, to step aside, but then to be able to call others into the wilderness, not to reside there like he was as a prophet, but to come to the river for transformation, for repentance, for being part of a new alternative life movement, to step forward, to make a difference. This morning, this three-part identity plays out as John welcomes Jesus to the wilderness. Jesus somehow found his way to his cousin, John the Baptist. And he was there standing shoulder to shoulder with all those that came from all of Judah and Jerusalem, shoulder to shoulder. And he came to the riverside and he sees John and he, he steps forward for John to baptize him. And of course, John the Baptist, Matthew, makes it really clear that John knew that he was not worthy not only to tie up or untie the sandals of this prophet, this Messiah, this rabbi, but he was surely not worthy of baptizing him, of bringing the water, the baptismal waters only over Jesus' head by lowering him into the river. He was not worthy to call Jesus to repentance, but Jesus was worthy, of course, to call him to repentance. And John says, I need to be baptized by you. I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Well, Jesus, again, standing shoulder to shoulder with all those that had come, the common people, the religious leaders, those who had come seeking a new life, repentance, and the cleansing of the River Jordan. Jesus responds, let it be so now. Let it be so now. In short, proclaiming that this is part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan that I stand, says Jesus. Not these, not his words, but my words. It is not to be worried about, but to understand that this is God's plan, that Jesus stand among God's people and share his life as an alternative way of being, according to God's will and way. John said, I need to baptize you. It's John's plan. John was doing all the baptisms. I need to be baptized by you. Jesus says, no. I need to stand with the people. The gospel proclaims God's affirmation of Jesus' living into humanity's brokenness. People were coming to the river to be healed, to repent, to have their hearts cleansed. And this particular gospel story affirms that Jesus has moved in as the word into the neighborhood, that Jesus has moved literally into the neighborhood, standing among the people who have come to seek a new way, that it's God's presence and word that affirms Jesus' identity. We hear it as it comes through the clouds and it is manifested through the heavens, as we can imagine it in the sign of the dove. It is God's presence and word that affirms Jesus' identity and his entering into the fray of life. Not apart, but into it. Jesus has an entrance into humanity, ushered through God's creative power and with God's pleasure. This is my beloved one with whom I am pleased. It's of great pleasure if we can imagine God sending forth Jesus to enter into all the struggles of human life and to participate in the human effort, the sacred effort of cleansing oneself and repenting and making a change in life. Jesus enters in that as a sinless one, but who stands among the sinful. Jesus is so forthright in his rejection of John's need to be the baptizer of others. 
but also of his need to be baptized by Jesus. Jesus tells John what we already know, that, in, that he has come into the world to fulfill God's promise of redemption, renewal, and recreation. Jesus enters the waters of baptism to rise up and before God's people to make known God's way of life, a spirit-filled way of life, an alternative way of life which gives birth, gives birth to odd, free, and able people, people of faith, people who work to bring into view and practice the gospel way of living, making a loving difference in the lives of others. It begins here at the font for us, for us who call ourselves Christians. Lots of people, people of all faith and no faith, making a difference in other people's lives. And we are so fortunate to be the benefactors of those and to share in that effort, wherever it is, community, state, nation, the world. But we as a baptismal community, we come from a special place, from an understanding of our relationship with God and God's relationship with us through Jesus Christ. The font is a significant starting place for all of us. Not a piece of furniture that sits idly by most months of the year, but as the center, as the intersection of humanity and God through a sacrament, just like the Lord's table. Terry Blankinger came to understand the difference jail names made in her life and the life of her sister inmates. To take on a different name meant so much. It was a way of resisting the powers of the prison system. We're going to take everything that you have, everything that you have, and render you a non-being for what you have done, says the system. But by taking on those names and by knowing one another by a different name, not by a number, they resisted that power. That power that was so dehumanizing and continues to be dehumanizing among countless thousands upon thousands of inmates. They took on those names because they wanted to be odd. They wanted to be free, and they wanted to be able, just as we, as a baptized community, are odd, free, and able to serve as warriors in a peaceful and powerful way of the word of God. They entered, they, the prisoners, entered an alternative way of being among each other. They started to see others as sisters with stories behind the names. It may have been the appearance that they had as Carrie wore the glasses, had the short hair and the young face. But those names meant more than just an appearance. They meant about who these individuals were. They refused to allow the prison system to completely define their humanity. Baptism defines us. Baptism defines the Christian life. The baptismal identity ministered by John, received by Jesus, and affirmed by God has been extended to every member of the baptismal community. From every font, we connect ourselves to that very baptism. We stand within a world where Christians throughout the world continue to stand shoulder to shoulder out of view of one another, yes, but grafted to one another through Christ. And when we think about the mission of the church and the power that it has to do good, we also must think about the power that the church carried out to do things and to live ways that were not good, but we think about the positive and the powerful nature of the sacrament of baptism that brings us forth as a different people for a purpose. We stand together in diversity, 
but formed of one section of cloth. Dominations may give us different shapes to our Christian living, but we all flow from the one font source of life. We are a baptismal community. And how hopeful it is, how hopeful it is to live into the radicalness of our baptism. How hopeful it is to imagine renewing our Christian Christian community to serve ecumenically, to reach out to other members of other baptismal communities, and to say we are one. What can we do together to make a difference? How wonderful and how radical it is to strengthen our community relationships in a time when all baptismal communities are struggling in this post-Christian time. How hopeful it is to bring our oddness, freedom, and abilities to serve in the context of interfaith actions. It's that we have this to bring, to add to the community of interfaith relationships. We have this to bring. We come as a baptized community to offer this in relationship, not to convert others, but to say, this is who we are and this is our strength. Bring your strength from the Jewish community, from the Islamic community, from the Hindu community. Bring your strength and let us together be the people who make change and make difference. This radicality of baptism not only makes us better and closer to God, but it allows us, in the terms of Wesley's covenant prayer, to intentionally lay ourselves aside to be employed as God sees fit. That the mark of baptism allows us to say we have been recreated, reborn for God's purposes. And on this Sunday, we remember and we rededicate ourselves to those purposes. Together we construct this framework this framework that goes beyond the walls of the church. It's a framework for doing God's will in a way that is unique, is powerful, in a way that the world so needs as we continue to struggle with the realities that seek to pull us apart, the political divisiveness that we we witnessed over the course of four days where personal agendas became the prominent and deciding factor over the common wealth of a nation. And it's us, we, the baptismal community, that can step into a context, a world like that, and offer that which brings together hearts and minds over and against that which separates hearts and minds. Together we have this construct, this framework for God's will in a world that has countless other frameworks, countless other ways of being named and known, initiated. But as Christians, we come in this unique place in time with a gift to offer A gift that has been constructed not to deny human potential, but to lift it up. To go to the waters, to reach in, to wade deeply, and to know that we do not do it alone. That we, we ourselves in the water, recipients of not only being washed by the water, but filled by the Spirit and named by God. As God names Christ the beloved, so are we, God's beloved, called to bring God's message of love into the world in our own odd and free and able ways. May we remember our baptism on this day. May you feel the power of that sacrament that lives on in you 
whether it was 10 years ago, or 60 years ago, or 70 years ago, or 80 years ago, it is still fresh, as fresh as the day that you received it. Live into your baptism. Give thanks for God's gift of love. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, you have heard our voice and you lean into our words. Listening, Holy One, you know well before we lift up the names of our beloved ones, their needs, their struggles, their joys, their sorrows. But you also know that we have a great need to be in holy conversation with you. Whether in silence where the whispers of our hearts cry out to you, or through the words that fall off our lips. And so, Lord, I have the awesome privilege of listening and praying and naming those who have been lifted up by your beloved community here. We pray and give thanks for young life in our midst and celebrate with Kai's family her second birthday. We give you thanks for all the children and the infants that are connected in this baptismal community and pray for their well-being, their learning, and their safety. Lord, our hearts are broken. We're left speechless. We have no way of understanding how a young mind of six years so undeveloped could be overwhelmed by the power of death. We pray, O oh God, for this young life. We pray for those who are affected by the loss of life. We pray, O oh Lord, for the school in Newport News. We pray for all the communities that are awakened once again to the trauma of gun violence and the reality that our nation has failed over and over and over and over again to address it. Lord, give us the courage as your baptismal community to stand shoulder to shoulder with those that we find as allies in an effort to bring sensibility and justice to the laws of this land, to regulate the use of weapons that are clearly manufactured for death. We pray, O oh God, this morning for those that are living with the realities of life-threatening diseases, and give thanks for the science and medicine that has extended life. And so this morning, oh God, we pray for our brother Brian. We raise our hands and hearts and lean into the internet space that is so holy in worship and pray and embrace him Pray for healing and strength and courage for Brian and for Heather. We pray for Diane and Roger and for those that surround them, for Jim, for they all know what it's like to be humbled by the fragility and realities of life. But you, O oh God, sent a humble one into our midst to give us strength and to offer us a healing presence and a hope beyond hope. Lord, we pray for safe travels for all of us, in the day-to-day -day travels that we embark upon for work, for study, for friendship, for family. 
We pray for those like Doug and Chris who are traveling long distances for safe arrival to be again among us. And Lord, lastly, we humbly pray for, for this church. As your baptismal community, you know the work that we are about. And we strive to turn ourselves over to your guidance, to your spirit, as we dare to take action to preserve, to sustain, and to expand our baptismal identity and the work that you call us to do. And so bless us, bless the leaders and the members and friends of this church. May we live with gratitude for all the efforts that have gone into and will go into our new life enterprise. The one that you have so defined already, have already completed in your holy mind and continue to reveal to us. Hear this and much more as we pray to you this morning. Amen. Let us now prepare ourselves to rededicate ourselves as again and again the baptized community as individuals and corporately and to offer our own gifts for the ministry of Jesus Christ.
Please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Gracious one, thank you for the gifts of water and spirit. Your baptized people are living signs of your loving generosity. You have formed us and made us your people. Now, O oh Lord, we respond with these gifts and ourselves. May what we place at your altar add to your holy work near and far. Amen. And while our closing hymn this morning is The Spirit Sends Us Forth to Serve, very proper for this baptismal celebration, this time of remembering that baptism sends us forth into the world. share with you as a blessing are, is the verse four that comes from the hymn that we just sang, the Spirit sends us forth to serve. Let us go to serve in peace, the gospel to proclaim. God's Spirit has empowered us. We go in Jesus' name. Go forth, be odd, be free, be able, in the tense of gospel love. Amen. Thank you.